Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the afternoon session of AMA Junior Camp. Um, my name is Kyle Thede. I'm the Education Specialist, and here to help me is the Education Director at AMA, Kyle Jarris. Hey, good to see you, Kyle. Good to see you. Man, I was having so much fun with the uh, helicopter from this morning. I uh, went out into the hallway and I was showing it to Vicki and uh, Yolanda, a few of the other staff here. Had a great time and uh, they were super interested in seeing it work. And uh, although we had to dodge it a few times here and there, we had a lot of fun. So <laughs> hopefully that's the same story as all the kids are seeing uh, out and about and uh, having fun with their projects too. Yeah, I certainly hope that everybody's been uh, having fun with theirs and learning a lot about how it flies and maybe even trying out different types of stabilizers. Um, but for right now, for this afternoon, we're very excited to have our fourth guest speaker with us this afternoon. His name is Jerry Warden. He's a longtime member of the AMA, and he has lots of really cool things to tell us. Um, hello, Jerry. Can you hear us? And... Uh Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Warden. I'm to you from Central Illinois here near Bloomington Normal. And just say hi to all your, your campers out there. Good afternoon. Well, We're all really the campers are real excited to, to hear from you and uh, see what you have to, to say and, and share with us. We got to look in audio. And just so the campers know, we've had a little bit of a delay with some of the audio today, so it might be a little bit of slowness between the two. Um, so we're going to roll with those punches and see how we do. I'm having trouble with I'll go ahead and get started. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can, uh, can. hear you. Go ahead and get started. I'm having trouble hearing you on my end. Uh, I'll just go ahead and try and start talking. And uh, basically, uh, I understand our campers are five to 13 years of age. And that's about the time that I was a kid back in the late 1960s. I went and, uh, and on the shelf was a, a plastic model airplane and, and it was referred to as the Cox PT-19, got a picture of the box oh, art, wow. Are you okay? And yeah, basically picture yourself being 11 or 12 years old and, and, and looking at the box and, and, uh, and seeing that aim. And basically the box would have read, uh, told you all the wonderful things that That airplane room. It... Oh, I think we might have lost Jerry. Um, I'll jump in real quick and say Jerry was sharing a little bit of his story earlier today and uh, was talking about how when he was a young man, probably it sounded like seven or eight, maybe he went into the uh, toy store to, to buy more slot cars and uh, stumbled upon a PT-19 uh, that looked very similar to this. And uh, that's how he got his start in model aviation. Um, looks like uh, Lee Ray is jumping in with a comment. That's pretty cool. Sounds like Terry just got one almost new in the box, which is really impressive. <laughs> um, you know, it's a really cool plane, and, and it sounds like this is how he got his start, how he kind of jumped in and uh, started flying uh, model airplanes. And uh, it was you control at first, I think he got into, uh, then control line. And um, I'm not sure. Kyle T, was he into RC at all? Yeah, that was actually something that I was looking forward to asking him about, um, comparing and contrasting um, what's great about control line flying, what's great about RC flying, and how they're different and how they're similar. Um, so uh, I really hope that we can hear his perspective on that because I'm really excited to hear about it. Um, yeah. But, I mean, that's an experience that a lot of people have had. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I think draws a lot of people to model aviation and full-size aviation is that it just, it looks so cool. Like yeah. you want to know more about that it. Warbird or whatever it is, or, or you hear about that new piece or even a new old piece uh, of, of aviation history and then being able to have it in your hands and then fly it yourself too. It's awesome. 
And I think it looks like Jerry might be coming back in. I don't know. Our producer. I think, uh, so. Fing I think so. Fingers crossed. Oh, here he is. Welcome back. Yeah. So here, here's the real deal. Okay. There's the cop PT-19. Hoping you can see that. Hey, there it is. That's hey, the there it is. Right there with that guy right there. Huh? And and back in the 1960s, this would have been nine dollars and ninety eight cents. The thing of it is, we bought this plane, and and I heard uh, Mr. Glenn talk the other day, and he said he couldn't get his running, and I can kind of relate that because we couldn't get this run, we couldn't get the PT19 to run, and we shortened the strings and decided to whip the airplane around <laughs> in a circle, <laughs> and that was fun. They had us control line fly not be able to turn the airplane so then lo and behold one day by divine intervention the motor ran we got the motor running and we got it out flying on strings and that was just be the beginning of a relationship for me with model aviation that, that continues until this day and and i've got some more airplanes back here behind me but we'll just focus on this pt-19 right now and, and basically I sent in some pictures of another one that I built, uh, uh, which was a P-38 Lightning. Uh, and uh, there's a video that goes with that to give the kids an understanding of, of control line flying is like. And, and if you want to, it, it, the, the pictures illustrate what it's like to build an airplane out of wood. There you go. Basically, all the wood for that airplane was right there in that box, in that little box. Back there, by the plane two or three years ago, just flying control line. And there it is after it's built. And there it is. It's so cool to see like a box arrive, take all the little pieces of it. And then, you know, you, you go through hours of building, painstakingly painting, getting the engines tuned and trimmed and running. And then this is the end result. You get to have something that you're having fun with, that you're enjoying as a group, as a community. Like it's really cool to see. What a great sound. Yeah, no kidding. Looks like a quick little guy, too. That's one thing that oftentimes with control line that a lot of people don't know is you can get longer lines or shorter lines. And Jerry alluded to this, too. Depending on the speed, the weight, you know, how, uh, how fast it's going is going to change how that length is. Now, Kyle T., have you gotten to fly control line yet? I actually have never flown control line myself. I've it it looks very exciting, but it also looks like it's very high pressure. It looks like you need to do everything exactly right, otherwise uh, you're gonna you're gonna run into trouble really quick. I've never quite been brave enough, but I kind of want to give it a try. I'm back in the show, fellas. Hello, welcome back. Yeah, we can hear you. Just certainly fine, can. Sir. I got to see. I went into that video, and basically that was the first flight for that airplane after we finished it. And it's one thing to be 12 or 13 years old with a with and spin around with an airplane like that, but when you get up into your 60s, basically I was just <laughs> praying for that thing to run out of gas. <laughs> and I, and, and, I had and a similar experience when I was trying that out. Yeah, you talked about sure. flying. Yeah, well, with. With the Cox little P-30 foot of strings, and with that P-38 there, that's a little he heavier, and that's actually a wire cable, real fire cable is what that flies on. So so basically, uh, when, when that plane, that was the first time it flew, that was quite a little adrenaline dump for the old guy here. Oh, it looks like we lost them. But but I can totally relate to that. Like you've got the jitters, the nervousness, you know, you're not sure exactly how it's going to be trimmed. You're getting ready to fly something. And uh, 
then especially to see something working and see it working well is a lot of fun. Um, you know, and what a gorgeous aircraft too. You know, you can really see the attention to detail and how much effort he put into making sure that thing looked nice. Um, you know, it's it's a wonderful ability. And, you know, model aviation is a lot about like the scale detail. Oh, it looks like Jerry's coming back. But yeah, that scale detail and adding those things to a profile plane like that is uh, is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And, and I don't know if you, if, you check, if you check the nose art up there, I named it old school because basically uh, that's what it is. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> there it basically is. I've transitioned to, yeah, yeah, old school. I've transitioned to radio controlled airplanes, but there's all, there's a magic in, in flying control line airplanes. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to, I'm going to stand up here for just a second. And I've got it. I've got an airplane. If you can bring a picture of me up on the screen and I can, and I can show you, try to show you how that this, how these planes are controlled. Okay. You see, this has an external bell crank. This is a replica that I built of the first balsa model plane that I built, which is what you transition to after you fly the Cox planes. And you can see this bell crank out here and it's hooked up to the strings that connect to the wing out here. I gotta, I gotta get oriented there. So I've got strings, we call them lead outs. And basically when you, when you pull on these strings, it makes the elevator go up and down. I'm, I'm gonna get, get situated here. Watch the tail, if I can get that situated. And you'll see it. there it went up. That makes the airplane go up. And then when you pull the other string, you can see the elevator has gone down. And that's that's the nuts and bolts of flying control line airplanes. And this is a replica again. It was a, an old a scientific kit designed by Walt Musciano back in the 1950s. And it was called Sislin Liz. And I kind of remember going to the hobby shop, Ray's, Ray's hobby shop, and Ray says, well, you got to stop flying the plastic and start building your own planes. And, and the thought that uh, an 11-year-old kid could build something that would fly, uh, I was kind of skeptical. And I remember I bought that kit probably on a Friday afternoon after school and had it done. The paint was still dry on Sunday when we went and flew it. And, of course, it flew like a million bucks. And that, and that was, again, another hook okay, I can build and fly airplanes, and that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. And then especially as you build them, you know how to fix them. It's not like trying to fix plastic parts. You know, you're fixing balsa. You can always find a little bit more balsa if you have to add a little bit of uh, structure behind that. Well, well, there's an important message for the kids that are watching this, too, because if you build your own airplanes, then you know how to fix it. There is some balsa wood in this and some iron-on covering, and – you know, if grown-ups wreck a car, they don't throw it away. They take it to the body shop and they fix it. If we wreck an airplane, we don't throw it away. And especially if we built it, we go to the – I'm kind of sitting in my workshop area right now. And I go get some wood, like you said, some balsa wood or plywood and some glue. And I fix it. And and a lot, a lot of times after a plane has been wrecked, it flies just as good or better. And it's just – more part of the rewarding experience of model aviation. Does that sound very rewarding? Um, I know that there's a that, that that that's a big part of it. I when I was uh, when I built uh, very simple model airplanes. I don't know if I've ever built anything quite that uh, quite that complicated, but I know that there have been uh, model airplanes that I've built that it can it can be kind of frustrating at first when it doesn't fly exactly the way you want it first. But if you build it. You know, there's always a way to modify it, and there's always a way to make it do what you want. So, um, don't don't get discouraged. Yeah, and it's really cool. There's one of yeah. our commenters that said they've built one out of a, a laser cut foam board and a spare ESC, a motor they had lying around. Like that's awesome. It's you know not necessarily the material that you're building out of, but it's the fact that you are building it. You're taking those components. That means you know how to fix it because you built it to begin with. You found that success or you found that failure point where it crashed, but then you get to tweak it, tune it, change to the CG, change the control surfaces and move on and uh, find more success. It's really a, a, a great um, analogy for life in some ways, but uh, definitely for modeling. Exactly. And, and the thing of it is back then, uh, we didn't have electric motors. We didn't have the lithium polymer. All that we had so it's was, was the nitromethane fuel. <laughs> 
and, and the foam the foam board building has really caught on. Uh, mm -hmm. But just for I've got a PT nineteen back behind me that I converted to electric and flew on twenty seven foot string inside of a gym. Uh, you know that's that's just but the hobby has come a long way in that regard. So, certainly, but the other. Yeah, well, yeah, I remember spending really hours perfect. trying to get my O four nines to run correctly. <laughs> it 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 takes it takes a lot of finesse. I'm going to use that basically. So you got a picture. I'm 12, 13 years old and flying, and then we get a little older in high school, and there's cars and motorcycles and other things, that kind of thing. Well, then I got married, and but I still had some of my old control line stuff but I didn't have any motors. And my wife for my birthday went to the local hobby shop here in Bloomington and bought a motor for me. And we couldn't get that motor to run. And the, I remember the owner of the hobby shop gave me directions. Here's the directions to a radio controlled airfield. These guys can help you get that to run. So I took, I took the directions and I ended up at an airplane club called the Central Illinois Radio Society, about 10 miles outside of Bloomington Normal. And, and there, uh, the, I saw radio control in person for the first time in my life because of that. And, and long story short, them guys, the experts out there, they couldn't get that motor running either, but it didn't matter because now I was ready to move on to radio control and, and, and transition. And that's where I met the membership, including uh, Kyle, your grandmother, out there at the Central Illinois Radio Society. That is a club that had its, it was established in 1964 by 10 or 11 guys, one, of, one being Gene, your grandfather, and basically is still going nonstop to this day. We're out near Funks Grove in Central Illinois. So I saw that and I saw them planes fly without control lines and bam, that was it. I was hooked. And that would probably have been the mid 1980s when, when I started flying radio control out there. And uh, I certainly know what field you're talking about. I spent a lot of time out there when I was younger uh, with my grandfather, as you mentioned, for AMA, for viewers of the camp. Uh, my grandfather was an AMA member for long, long time, and he spent a lot of time out at that flying field, and, and so did I. And um, it sounds like there's a, there's a very special community that is centered around that club and centered around the AMA. And um, I was hoping you'd be able to talk about that um, while we had you on. We've, um, we've talked this week about how great a model aviation is as an educational tool and as a recreational tool, and yesterday even with our guest speaker about how it's a great professional tool. Um, but it's also a really special community and there's a lot of special people that are all involved with it. And that's really what keeps people involved with it for the course of their life. And um, I was hoping you'd just be able to, to share some insights about that. What makes this community so special and what keeps you involved? Uh, of course. Yeah. So, so basically I'm in Bloomington, normal Illinois, and, and there are probably six or seven clubs within a 50 mile radius of our club out here in, in Funks Grove. There's one in Peoria, Washington, Pekin, Streeter, Champaign. I might be fitting one, but the bottom line is I could go into one, any, to any one of those flying fields and, and there are, it's family, basically. There are people there I know by name, old friends, and you make new friends. Uh, and when you there, there are various kind of flying events and you go from club to club and, and it's basically one big family. Just in a, another example, my son and I had the grandkids and we were taking a trip to Six Flags, St. Louis, Missouri. And we happened into a club that we've never been to before outside of Rolla, Missouri and just drove up and, and started telling, you know, about our club and, and basically your instant family, you know, you're talking airplanes uh, and it doesn't matter that you're strangers because you're you're really not strangers, and that's and and that's the, the the Academy of Model Aeronautics and the family ship of members that go along with that that type of thing, and the AMA you know the AMA basically is the rule making uh, body for the various events that we participate in, whether it be pylon racing or pattern or, or that kind of thing. There are events scheduled 
free, you know, when the weather gets nicer, weekend, all about the flying season. And, you know, you can go on your website and do the events about what's going on. It's a really cool aspect of the community of, of aero modelers, you know, that you mentioned, like you can go anywhere, go to a club, start talking planes and, and you're part of that family there too. And, um, you know, one of the greatest aspects of our clubs, whether it be a middle or a high school club, a college club or a traditional aero modeling club is the, uh, the really the camaraderie that takes place. Everyone's there to help each other out, to give some good natured ribbing uh, on occasion when it's deserved. Uh, but also just to really share this this passion that is aviation in general. And, of course, our segment of it, which is model aviation. It's really neat. Uh, we had some great questions coming through uh, for you, and I wanted to bring some of those up. Uh, one of them was, uh, how many RC planes have you built? I, you, know, you know, basically, I, I would say somewhere between – 15 and 20 RC planes. You know, that there, there, there's, there's, there's a, an urge. Sometimes you get an urge to build sometimes. It, and, and then you, I have to include the control line planes that I've built as well. You know, there've been a few more control line planes. So there's a building process that you go through, you get that urge to build, but then sometimes there's a re rebuilding process. We had those mishaps, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to build there. Yeah several planes over the years, uh, different, you know, war, war, warbirds, trainers, pylon racers, the, you know, variety, just exploring, you know, the, the extent or the boundaries of model aviation. You know, basically, I, you know, I'm, I, I build with balsa and plywood. I'm an old school kind of guy. I'm way by the fact that, you know, they lay up molds and fiberglass and it comes out pre-pit and those kind. That, that stuff has gone way past me, but I still enjoy you know, a build right now. I'm working on an old World War One airplane that needs some shit. And I've got I've got airplanes that I've built. I've got a Spitfire that I built in 1998. I've got planes that I built that that, are, that have been around for years. And and still, I've got an airplane that your grandfather started years ago, never finished. And I finished, and it's still around. And I could have it uh, uh, airworthy in an hour or two. If I was called upon, I want to share a picture with you. If I could, can I do that? Absolutely. I'm going to put this down here. I want you to look. Uh, uh, Mr. Glenn talked about, and you guys were talking about the Tuskegee Airmen back there. I think it was on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. This is my mm -hmm. son, Justin. Uh, I think he's going to be 37 years old, but this was way back when, before the Red Tails movie. There was a movie on HBO called the Tuskegee Airmen. Had Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne, I think, Cuba Gotting Jr. It was a very well done movie. Uh, still a good watch today. We happened to be building a P-51 Mustang at that time and said, hmm, let's go ahead and make a Tuskegee Airmen Mustang. So we built it. Thank you. Yeah. And you see, we covered it with chrome Monaco. It shimmers in the sun when it's flying that kind of thing, you have to go back in the, you know, this probably would have been the, the mid 1990s, somewhere along in there. The internet was still in its infancy. And we posted a picture of this airplane on the internet. I don't remember how, but we did. And there <laughs> were some people over at the University of Indiana in Kokomo. And they saw that picture and they were hosting a Tuskegee gathering and they sent a van over and picked up this airplane and took it back to the University of Kokomo for display. And in return, they sent us a Tuskegee Airman hat that was signed by all the attendees at that oh, Tuskegee wow. Airman gathering. You guys got now the better end of that deal, deal, but what a cool project. Yeah. And, and, and the thing of it is, my son is 37 years old. He's still in the hobby right now. And he's, he's, if you went on YouTube and typed in and did a search under a, a video called Trio of Fokers, you'd see him flying a great, a, a very large scale Foker triplane mm. that he flies. So I just wanted to get that picture out there. That's one of the planes that we built. That's very cool. 
And that's uh, that's that's another thing that's yeah. always been very interesting to me about model aviation is that there's the chance to to uh, to take those moments in history and those stories from history, like the Tuskegee Airmen, which is one of the one of the great stories of American aviation, and you're able to recreate a part of it and able to kind of contribute to that story a little bit um, and share it with other people in a way that is really exciting. And that's 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 very cool. Well, well, then you then you extend that a little bit further. Your thought process, if you've got a little bit of an imagination, you could actually put yourself in the cockpit of that airplane as it's flying around. I forgot to mention, my son still has this airplane, and he could have it ready to fly in a couple hours. And, and, and it's like I said, that the, you know they they can last a long time. But for me, the magic of it is I can imagine myself in that airplane flying around in the sky and, and and that really that's what gets me going that's neat now joe you mentioned your son flies uh did uh did your parents get involved at all with aviation when you started to get into it no the, the thing of it is I, I i i come from a railroad family a family of railroaders and i actually had some some model trains when i was a kid uh, and I still have some of them monitoring for, for days gone by, but, but uh, uh, no, no, my, my, you know, that they may have, the thing of it is that the other thing I forgot to mention, we take our Cox airplanes and the planes that we built over to the schoolyard, the local schoolyard back in the day. And we were, we got good at what we did. The, the neighborhood people would bring their lawn chairs out <laughs> and sit around our circle and watch us fly these airplanes at the schoolyard, and that that was that was kind of the cat's pajamas back in the 1960s. You know, they lawn chairs, and we had a little audience usually to perform. We were flying these planes. Yeah, do a little bit of showboating and have some fun, right? Well, it's it's, it's all it's always great to you know, even if you're flying your radio control, it's nice to have an audience and to be able to entertain people with your flying. That's just a little frosting on the cake you know when you when you've got people that are interested and in, in that kind of thing you know you can share those kind of things and uh and i i put in uh and i'm gonna backtrack a little bit there's there's a carl goldberg certificate that i put in in the pictures in my folder there is there any chance we can bring that up i think we're working on that right now and there it is Okay. And basically, this certificate, you had to build, you had to build your Carl Goldberg. Carl Goldberg used to be a big name with the building kits. And basically, when you built a little control line airplane in a little corner of the instructions, there was you build your airplane, you make it fly as good as you can. And, and once you've got it all dialed in, you, you time it with a stopwatch. And then you had to ascend time. U.S. postage to Carl Goldberg, and you can see this is what this, this is my pilot's license, the only pilot's license that I ever got, and, and basically, I think it's dated November twenty eighth, nineteen sixty nine. That's amazing. <laughs> That's very cool. And the fact that Carl Goldberg, like probably every time one of these came in the mail, he signed that happily, you know, like that's really cool. Oh, it looks like we lost Jerry this time. Four minutes and three seconds. Yeah, that's a heck of a flight. Honestly. Yeah. He had to get the 60 seconds to get the certificate, but he got this at four. That's awesome. Oh, it looks like we have Jerry back. The, the thing of it is, most of your control, yeah, the, the Cox airplanes, you'd get three or four minutes out of a little tank of gas with those things. That's that's kind of basically what you're supposed to get. So really, they, they were expecting you to underachieve because three or four minutes wasn't wasn't hard to get at all out of those airplanes. Yeah. And again, early on, you get, you know, and even later, we'd get dizzy. But after you've done it for a while, you kind of develop, you know, you don't get dizzy anymore. Yeah, the, the two times I've flown control line, I definitely got a little dizzy. And I tried all the tricks, just focus on the plane and all that. But fortunately, they didn't give me a full tank on either of those flights. So I was able to stand upright. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so you go back to the back to the Academy of Model Aeronautics. When you're having this much fun and fellowship and that kind of thing, you kind of look look for ways to give back. And, and and basically, I remember the associate vice president then Charlie Bauer putting out a call. He needed a competition coordinator for District Six, which is Kentucky, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. And I went ahead and volunteered for that. So for several years, my responsibility was to coordinate the different contests that went on in that four state region, be it, you know, class A events like pylon racing or pattern or your class C or your class C restricted, you know, which your, your fun flies and that kind of thing. And I got to meet and talk to a lot of people that way and schedule on the various events for that. And, and, and then uh, later on, I left that and, and became an, a, a vice, an associate vice president under Charlie Bauer and, and, my, the guy that took my place as a competition coordinator for District 6 was none other than Randy Cameron, who I believe is the executive vice president for, for, for the academy right now. But yep. the, one, the one thing I have to say about that, I, st I didn't have a lot of knowledge when I started on that competition coordinator thing. Every time I called and started at Reston, Virginia or Muncie, Indiana, I always got help. I never got put on hold. I always got the information that I needed in a, in a good way, and I always, whether I was at, whether I was, uh, you know, CD in my own event or or uh, officer in the club, which I was was for several years. Every time I would call the academy, I, it was a positive experience for me, and I always to this day feel good about paying my dues because basically uh, what's going on there is the glue that kind of holds everything together out there. And there's a lot of good work happening by a lot of good people. Well, you know, a lot of good work happening by a lot of good people is definitely part of it. And we we couldn't do it here at headquarters alone. Like we we lean heavily, as you well know, on our volunteers and the people who are passionate about aviation to bring that to, to students, to adults, to communities all across the nation. And so, you know, while we may be the people that sometimes people call into with questions, you know, it's definitely the passions that drive this hobby and uh, this love of aviation. So uh, my hat's off to everybody out there who's volunteering, who's helping out, yeah. who's uh, coordinating events, mowing the fields at, at their flying clubs and uh, talking to kids about model aviation and adults. Um, it's, uh, we, it, it's, it's impossible to do from yeah. one central location here in the country. You know, we really do depend on our members. Okay. We, we just kind of went through an ordeal at our club where, well, we, we lost our field where, where we used to fly over at the Thompson farm. And then we leased a field for several years and we were on the verge of losing that field. And basically we, we conducted a fundraiser and, and basically we were able to raise money, but there's a lot of work involved just in the perch land and our club president and, and, and I think his secretary, being Bob Statsholt and, and Larry Cooper Schmidt, they, they in, in, in a company with Randy Cameron and Gary Himes, who is our current District 6, they all did a lot of work to help us secure the field that we're at right now. And we were able to buy land and, and basically building and improving on that as we go. I want, to, I, I want to change directions a little bit. Could you bring up a picture, please, of the Sterling Lancer? that I have back there. This was my first radio controlled airplane build. It's, it's a yellow airplane. I'm hoping that Matt can bring that picture oh. up for us. And, and basically, I remember ordering this kit from an outfit called Penn Valley. There it is, the Penn Valley Hobby Supply in Pennsylvania. And I remember this kit being $28. It was on sale, that kind of thing. And I found myself wondering, okay, can I build a radio controlled airplane that flies and ba using what I've acquired in terms of my control line building and that kind of thing. And there's, there's the end result. That's my first RC build, but I had a lot of help from club members at the club, you know, fr help from Gene Barker, your grandfather and, and help uh, from a guy named Rick Horth, who's, who's passed away. These guys helped. I couldn't have done it without help from club members. And I never could have built anything that looked that good right out of the chute. Uh, I was gonna say, it looks like you nailed it, man. Build. Well, the thing of it is, I'd never worked 
I'd never worked with the heat shrink covering. All, all my work was silk and dope up to that point, that kind of thing. And Rick Horth was a, a fireman at that time. He, he just took the bull by the horn, said, I'm going to help. He used to call me Jerboy. Jerboy, I'm going to help you out with this. And, and, we, and this is what we turned out. And I remember, of course, you know, just like I remember my first control line flight, my first control line build flight. I remember this and seeing that plane jump off the ground and say, okay, now I can build a radio control. And it, it, you can see it's kind of a pattern trainer kind of layout there. And it's just a beautiful flying airplane. It was still flying when I ultimately sold it at a swap meet many years ago. Well, if you're watching and uh, you recognize this airframe, uh, jump in and say, uh, say hello. Because <laughs> you know it's probably out there floating around somewhere. Yeah, it, it, it's been a long, long time ago that I was at the swap meet and it had been wrecked and rebuilt and it still looked pretty decent, that kind of thing. And then, then there just comes a time, okay, this one, this has got to go, that kind of thing. But again, <laughs> that, that the, the, the sense of community, I, I remember I, I could, you'd watch, you'd watch these guys, you know, and, and I remember in particular Gene Barker and there was another charter member, uh, Charlie Kappas, these guys flew with precision. They just didn't fly an airplane down and, and, and just jam it through there. You could tell that the discipline came through the airplane, you know, from, you know, I don't know if they flew pattern, but these guys, they, and, and Jim Barker in particular was, was challenging. He's always challenging you, to, you know, work on your precision, make your loop round, those kind of things. Just, you know, I remember you talked the other day about, competition and basically if you participate in a form of competition be it pylon racing i've done a little bit of that be it pattern flying i've done a little bit of that those kinds of things when you have to push yourself when you're being pushed those things come together and make you a better pilot i remember flying contest in charleston illinois and a thunderstorms had rolled through and I remember flying my round at a pattern competition and the, and the wind was probably blowing like 20 miles an hour, changed 180 degrees during my flight while I was flying the flight, that kind of thing. And, and, and basically you're trying to land on a runway. It was cold wind, both ways that changed during that flight. But at the end of that competition, I was no longer terrified or afraid to fly in the wind and I was a more disciplined, a better pilot. And it doesn't matter if you're pylon racing or pattern flying, it improves your elevates your confidence. And those are both little sub families within the greater family, pad flyers, the, the, the pylon racers and those kinds of things. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of ways to stay involved with this community. And it sounds like you've gotten a lot out of it and you've given a lot back to it over the over the time that you've been a part of it. So um, I kind of want to start bringing this uh, this conversation to a close. But I wanted to ask you, um, is there any advice that you would have for our viewers th this afternoon about how best to stay involved with this community and how they can get involved and stay involved for a long time and the best way to to stay excited about uh, model aviation. Okay, basically for me, uh, it's a lot like church. And basically you, you, you come together as a community to rekindle each other's excitement or inspiration, whether it be about, uh, about your religion or whether it be about model aviation and you've got to surround yourself. Well, it, you don't have to. You want to surround yourself. You just get that much more out of the hobby when you're in it with other people who share that same experience with you. I've got one more picture uh, that, that, that I'm actually uh, with another airplane. I'm trying to start it up front. And I'm hoping before, before we get done here that you show that picture if, if we could. All right. I think we're going to pull it up. Which picture is it you're looking at? Yeah, basic, basically, I, I, I'm under a, a canopy and I'm starting up an airplane and there's a guy holding on to it. I think we found it. 
Yeah. There we and, go. And basically, I I would say, as we're winding down, I, I've kind of come I've kind of come full circle because I've it, it, in my in my younger days as a, as a kid, a young person, I was into the Cox PT19. This one right here is is also a PT19. Uh, I was just so endeared to the airplane, and I know a lot of guys out there that are my age. Just to me, the the PT19 was just a special time in my life, uh, and, and and took me a lot of places that I never would have been to. And I've come kind of full circle, and I'm back to to flying a larger scale PT19. This is my favorite control or, or my favorite radio controlled airplane to fly. I like to call it an old man's airplane because it's not super fast, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun to fly. Well, and it's gorgeous. I'm sure it's enjoyable to fly and. Uh... You know, they're, they're easy to see, easy to tell what the orientation is. And just uh, um, it's an airframe that uh, you can constantly learn and grow and, and practice that precision, as you're you're saying earlier. Uh, it's really neat. And thank you so much for sharing your story. I know we've had a few technical difficulties today, but, um, you know, I know I'm speaking for both myself and Kyle and everyone else who's listening in the live stream. This has been a pleasure and uh, great to hear about how this is a community that, that works together and uh, that there are ways to get involved and to stay involved. So thank you so much. Yeah, I want to echo what Kyle the said. Opportunity and, and for you young kids. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to echo what Kyle said and uh, thank you very much for your time and for your stories. And um, this is, it shares a, a different side of model aviation that we haven't really touched on this week, but I think it's a, it's a really important one. It might be the most important one. So thank you very much for, for being a part of this program and for, and for sharing your, your obvious love for this hobby um, with the people who are watching. It, it was, it was a privilege talking with you uh, and, and your, to your kids out there, just, just go after it and, and and, and I hope you have as much enjoyment out of the hobby as I found in, in, in my experiences. Well, and speaking of some of those experiences and the fun, it, camp's not over. We've got one more day with a couple of uh, surprises uh, in store. So, Kyle, I'm going to let you finish up with some of that info. And, um, you know, it's been a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow, too, guys. All right. That's right. We still have one day left with uh, AMA Junior Camp. Um, tomorrow morning, we'll be back at um, 11 a.m. Eastern with another project that we're going to be building. And that might not even be the last project that we work on tomorrow. So uh, you definitely don't want to miss out on the morning stream and also especially the afternoon stream. when we have our final guest speaker of the week um, who's going to be coming to us from NASA. So that's something very exciting that we're going to be sharing with you tomorrow afternoon. You definitely do not want to miss out on the last day of AMA Junior Camp 2021. But until then... Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your rotorcraft, and uh, we will see you tomorrow.